Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Eva Hartel, and I'm going to talk to you about digital comparative judgment. Um, this session, you can also always post uh, questions in the chat, and please share on Twitter. Um, the hashtag is on your top right corner. I will provide an overview of comparative judgment, what it is and how, how it can be applied. It has many ways of up to which in which it can be applied. So uh, I work in uh, Haninge municipality, where I work together with schools and different projects, most primarily focused on STEM education, but also on formative assessment in general. I'm involved in a couple of, of research projects, but today I'm going to talk about a methodology called comparative judgment. But first, just to frame this, the whole session, are these two quotes, which I take a moment to read them for yourself. These two quotes uh, is all are the quotes that I always carry with me and during this presentation as well. And also, uh, when I say formative assessment, this is what I mean. It's a use evidence about learning to adapt what happens in the classroom to better meet the learner's needs. And this is generic, uh, but also very subject specific. Comparative judgment has been applied in uh, various set settings and different subjects and different contexts. Um, but my examples would primarily be from STEM education. But first, as a Swede, I have to talk about the weather. Today, here in Stockholm, where we are, uh, it's uh, sunshine and cold. It's about below seven degrees. It's not the coldest I've ever experienced. And, but I can assure you, it's colder outside than it's inside. When I compare the temperature in here, it's kind of warm. It's not the, the warmest I've ever experienced, but it's warmer than outside. And I think we can agree upon all that it is warmer in here than outside when we compare. We, we could use a thermometer to measure these differences, but then we need to know which scale we want to use. Is it Fahrenheit, Celsius, or some, something else? But in overall, we can make the judgment that it is warmer in here than outside. Here are some pictures of pumpkins. And why on earth am I showing pumpkins? It's nearly Christmas and pumpkin is not the, the vegetable that we use for Christmas, but at least here we don't. Um, but if we look at these pumpkins, you can see that the one on the top, to your top right corner, is larger. We can assume that that one is heavier than the small one in the middle, the bottom, in the middle. Perhaps one of the white colored pumpkins are heavier than the one in the middle, but perhaps it's uh, less um, heavy than the larger one on top, in the top right corner. I think we can agree upon that from our experience. And if we ever experience the pumpkin, we can agree upon that. We could also use, we could weigh them to have an absolute measure, but perhaps we don't need that at the moment if we just want to agree which one is heavier. Uh, why am I talking about the weather? Well, that could have obvious reasons because I'm a Swede, we always talk about the weather, but, and pumpkins and heavy or heavier. Um, this comes back to comparative judgment. This guy on the picture, his name is Louis Leon Thurston. He, is a psych he was a psychiatrist. He tried to treat his patients. He, tried to, he, he was into psychometrics, so he liked to measure things on absolute scales. But he soon realized when he was treating his patients who was traumatized, it, it was difficult to treat them and see if they made progress, if they felt better when he was using an absolute scale. So he tried to find other ways and then he he reflected upon it for a while and, and tried different methods and he ended up with a law of comparative judgment, which, which in, in a, at a glance, you could say, it's that you compare. For instance, if he would ask his patients, so how, how, do, you, how do you feel better now? 
that's that's perhaps difficult to say but if you say do you feel better today than you did yesterday or the day before that is easier to say than and also much easier to say than if you just say how how well do you feel now on a scale from one to ten he was treating patients who were traumatized from an experience from crime and a severe crime how do you measure a severe crime well there are laws for that of course but you could also uh, that's the, the, the experience that the the one who has been been um, uh, experienced that assault and um, so it oh never mind I, I won't go into details now I could talk about this forever uh, but in education we do comparative judgment we do this intuitively in our practice as teachers we do this as intuitively well as human beings we compare all the time compare the weather is warmer in here than outside it's cold outside but it's much colder somewhere else perhaps and also from our own experience we bring our own experience into our education our teaching and learning activities this is a picture from japan where the japanese teacher the welding teacher shows his students a welding a melt and he compared that to he compared two melts and from his experience and his knowledge he pinpoint and contrast what he says as a good melt compared to less good welt instead of saying this is 95 percent better than this one he can instead say this one is better and then he he explain why it is better and the students can compare these two and see the difference he invites his his uh, students to his his experience his expertise also in terms of of um, uh, artwork for instance these are two pictures from from a school in Honinge actually uh, and you can compare them which one is better? Perhaps you like the one to the, uh, to your left, perhaps, or you like the one to the right. Well, it depends what you're looking for. If the if the students are practicing how to do modern art, naive naive is this art, then the one to the right perhaps is most accurate at this moment. But if you are more into romantic art, then perhaps the one to the left, which is why I have a picture of Winnie the Pooh here. It's very important in assessment that you know what to look for before you start looking for it. You can't cover all the things that can happen, but it's a good idea. It's, a, it's good to have an idea of what is about to happen. And it's very good and it's prosperous for your students to know what you want them to learn. So, and Winnie the Pooh says, it's better to know what to look for before you start looking for it. Comparative judgment could be a tool to unpack what teachers emphasize as criteria for success, what they emphasize as good quality work. And I will give you some examples of, on how to do that. Digital tools, a comparative judgment can be made, well, without any digital tools at all. Uh, but digital tools can facilitate the process of comparative judgment. You get another, it's, you can be multiple judges, you can also be, have different kinds of uh, evidence of learning. Here's an example of a portfolio uh, with text and pictures, but you could also have portfolios of, of um, film you can, or student can make a presentation or you can, well, all kinds of, of digital evidence you can have here. And you do co pairwise comparisons. You, you, should, you, you show this and you, you can you watch th these two pairs and then you have in an iterative process another pair and another pair is presented to you while, while you do this it's kind of hard to explain this in words it's much easier if you have a go and have a trial and there are multiple different kind of tools but well, not multiple uh, there are a, a couple of tools available for com digital comparative judgment and i suggest that you explore so when you do comparative judgment and you should have these pairwise comparisons, you choose one um, as better. I can go back, but one as better. And then you can, and then one, and then two, and two. there are um, pairwise comparisons in this iterative process. It's almost like a Swiss tournament. And you end up with a rank order. 
and rank order is what oh, people get a bit um, they think it's kind of problematic with rank orders it can be if it's, it depends on what you use them for the rank order provided here is it doesn't correspond to any grades or anything it's just a, a professional consensus from the group of judges better and also very good it doesn't have it's not better or worse it's better so all of these for instance could be performing re really well but this is the rank order that that produced by the, the group of judges and when you press these this is also a practical thing with digital tools you can have you have this rank order and then you press and you can see the student work say we press number 15 for instance and then you see the student work and then you can press again and again and you can see and we can see this and those of you who are into technical drawings you have i guess something to say about how this students have performed their technical drawings there are some standards that not are not achieved here so perhaps we need to teach them more we can have this as a basis for group discussion so there are lots of things you can do this was just a brief overview of comparative judgment and you can use it for many different things both summative and formative purposes you can also track progress and feedback and peer feedback i will give you an example of that i think you can use it as teacher training and so um, have a trial on different uh, quality work moderation and i think ict here is a servant instead of a driver uh, we should be careful when we chose if we want when we choose to embed digital tools in our education and our teaching and learning activities but when it is a servant instead of the driver and my primarily emphasis on the compared to judgment is that it's a, it's a catalyst for discussion and I would use it as a research method. Before you get overwhelmed of how if you want to have a trial and try different digital tools I think you should really choose very carefully and especially, especially make sure that you follow the software provider follows GDPR and also provides support and also in terms of ethics. There are large scale uh, trials of comparative judgment and I think you must be very careful when you handle student data and also the student work. Who owns the student work? Uh, who owns the essay or the portfolio that the student have uh, produced? Is it you or is it the student? Check your legal requirements and also in terms of ethics. It's one of the benefits of embedding the research in school development programs is that we have as a ground rule to always if, for instance, seek informed consent. Um, now I will give you some examples. The first one will be on teachers' assessment practices. Here we had a, uh, an experiment. We, we did an intervention with a um, primary school. The kids were 11 or 12 years old. And they, they designed a robot um, a model and also a portfolio. And you, it was a multimodal portfolio and they gather the evidence of learning by themselves. So there were lots of data. And then the, student, the teachers, there were five teachers, and here is one of the teachers. Uh, she is conducting comparative judgment on the student portfolio. So she was produced, uh, presented with a pair of two, and two portfolios at a time, and then she chose one portfolio as better. And then she also provided a comment why she was choosing this one as better. And we use this for research to find out what do teachers emphasize as criteria for success in technology education. Uh, it turned out, turned out that it, they emphasized to see the narrative of the portfolio. It wasn't that surprising because it was a design task. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, we did not know that before, um, which is why we investigated it. And we also uh, interviewed the teachers what they thought about doing this comparative judgment, uh, the five of them. And they said it was uh, a nice experience to experience other than their own student work. It's not that often you as a teacher have the privilege to see other students work than, than your own. It took them about an hour to conduct these pairwise comparisons through comparative judgment. And it, it was 25 portfolios. It took them one hour and we had a reliability of 98.3, which is high. 
We uh, then another study which I conducted with Scott, uh, Emily, and uh, Greg at Purdue University. Uh, it was a, sort of a follow-up on, on this criteria uh, for success. We had 700 plus, uh, more than 700 student uh, work, and they we did a comparative judgment in an international perspective. What does different context where, where we had judges from Sweden, America, and the UK slash Ireland, and they in uh, in th three groups they did comparative judgment and found that um, on, on the same student work. And we found some interesting differences, which we tried to explain in the article mentioned below. We could see different kinds of um, what they emphasize. Swedes, for instance, emphasize less is more and functionality, which is that surprising, perhaps. Who knows? But it's very interesting. And this study also um, generated a discussion <laughs> within the, the research community and also we talk about technology education but what what do we mean by technology education this was just a short summary you can read the paper if you like so to stimulate dialogue we do this we, we compare and we, we talk about this and we we end up with the result but we, then we we start to analyze the data out of this and no software is needed like this uh, the, the, this uh, welding um, example uh, but it's easier if you have. It's easier to collaborate across nations if you have a digital tool, and and I think it may have the potential to increase affordances for teachers' assessment practices, which is something that I um, is, are very intrigued about. To emphasize the the the, the environment which stu uh, which teachers are are situated in, and the teacher said this was. Anonymously reported that they enjoyed the overall experience. So it's nice when teachers uh, enjoy what you do, but more importantly, it's more important that the students learn. So what can they benefit from comparative judgment? Well, for instance, they when if teachers um, may um, embed peer feedback in the, the learning activities, that's one thing to do. Um, and you can do that in a traditional way and always when in terms of, of feedback is always important. The only thing that matters actually, uh, as William says, is what, what the students make out of it. Does, do they use it and how, how they re react upon it? So uh, um, feedback in theory can be very well, very good, but also it matter, the only thing that matters is how, what, how the recipient um, react upon it. And this is an ongoing study, and this is so exciting. It's a European project. We are 13 partners from eight different European countries. Uh, we, we try to design an um, experiment and trial um, learning activities in the STEM subjects, all emphasizing sustainable de development and targeting the Agenda 2030 goals. And here they have there are some students, and this is also uh, we have two master students, uh, Ida and Camilla, who are doing their master thesis within this project. And they have done a, an amazing job. It's not published yet, but it will be soon. And the students uh, um, have chosen an area in the vicinity of their school, which isn't used much. And so they were asked to redesign this area. What do they want to use this area for? And how can we make it better? And also with a twist of Agenda 2030. So transportation, and and what kinds of cho choose different kinds of material from a sustainable development perspective. They also learned lots about math, mathematics, and chemistry and technology, of course. And they produced digital portfolios, um, and then they did peer assessment. So this is the overview, the research design overview. And um, so the arrow describes the, the process of where, where the students were working. They were working in groups um, and we conducted online observations. With some I did that with some colleagues uh, from KTH. And then the students made peer feedback and they continued to, they, uh, the feedback comments were, were um, fed back and used. And then they finalized the project. We also made interviews with teachers and um, and the students. 
And here we do the these online observations. I just wanted to show you because it's such a, such a nice... Um, during this pandemic, we we're not allowed to visit the schools, so we did online observations instead. And the benefits of the digital tools, like comparative judgment, which is shown here, is that uh, regardless of where you are, you can access this. Um, so for an online education, or it, it's really easy accessible if you choose a, a, a good tool, that is. Here is uh, the, the judge's view, the students in this experiment, uh, or where they do comparative judgment and they did peer feedback. So this was a double, um, double dual peer feedback, you could say, because it's to each student uh, were sat in front of the computer and peer assessed their, their peers' work. And but they provided comments. They chose one as better, and we had a long, thorough discussion on this with the students beforehand. Uh, the teacher did that, so just to make sure that everyone was what, what knew what they were going to do. Uh, and then they were presented with these two two uh, portfolios, and they they chose one as better. But they also provided feedback to their peers. Why is this better? Or have you forgotten to fill that out? Or you have not done that, um, or you have done that really well as well. Um, and by being exposed to this, uh, their peers' um, portfolios, they also provide feedback on their own. So the judges in this, uh, um, here it was the students, they also get feedback from their peers by looking at these um, uh, students, their, their peers' work. And this study is influenced by a study conducted at Purdue University, by, uh, directed by Dr. Scott Bartholomew, where he did, um, they compared, um, they compared, uh, they set up an experiment where students did a design task and then they um, did peer feedback the tra traditional way, face to face, and and half of the group uh, did peer feedback through ACJ, adaptive comparative judgment, and they found that the students who experienced the the peer feedback through ACJ, they uh, achieved better in the end. And they cannot explain exactly why this happened, but it they think they they suggest that it is a worked example effect that they because they get to see, they get the flavor, a scent of, of, their, of their friend's work. Which is why it's so in, in, interesting to find out more. So can it uh, benefit the student learning? Um, well, who knows? Not by, by default, it cannot, but it depends on what you do with it. So here, are, this is just an illustra illustration of how these feedback comments in, are uh, fed back within the process. So it's, it's always important when you work with feedback that the feedback is fed back in the process and that, that the recipient can actually have the opportunity to do, to act upon it. Um, and I'll go back. We also have the student work here. So we could see before uh, in, the in the research design, you could see how the student work looked before the, the, um, they received the feedback comments. And then we could also see uh, what, they, what they did with the feedback. And we also have the feedback comments. And we are currently analyzing that data right now. And it's super exciting. And perhaps I can um, talk about this in the research at Haninge 2022. Who knows? To be continued. But I think, uh, well, I don't think, this is the conclusion for CJ compared to judgment. It has the potential to facilitate peer feedback. It has, it's very powerful as a catalyst for discussion. There are other studies, uh, studies for instance, Canty and Siri et al., who have shown that students, they saw very positive in making this pairwise comparison and that they learned more by critically examining their mistakes and also to reflect upon their own mistakes or or not just a, uh, mistakes in a positive way. And also these pairwise comparisons, they had um, they provide support for learners to more critically examine what, what, what how they can become do even better. 
But there are, of course, ethical uh, considerations here that you should always be very careful about. So think ahead what you want to do. Oh, here comes, <laughs> sorry, here is this, um, the example of what the student work. Uh, I must have mismatched the, the order of, the, of this. Here you can see uh, one of the things that the students at the uh, open spaces wanted to do. They wanted to create a jump yard at the backyard of their school. And at first they had not filled out the, the task, subtask in, to motivate why they chose a certain material, etc. And also you can see that the sketches they have done, is uh, um, they, they can improve as well. And the comments, there, they, they are in Swedish now, but you can see that they have, uh, they get comments like, you haven't filled out the, the, um, all your subtasks. And then when we look back in, and we, when we see, when we analyze the portfolios after the feedback, we could see that they have filled out all the subtasks. Uh, but also we can see also that it doesn't, it is very um, difficult to analyze just the feedback comments. You should always have, it's much easier, or perhaps it's even more difficult when you have the, the, the authentic student work and the comments prior and after the feedback uh, review. So, this is a way to invite your students. Well, actually, this is a shout out. Invite students to your own areas of expertise. Uh, you can do this in different ways. This is an example from, from a school that um, in Honningen, where they have, in a very, uh, in a very nice way, they have produced different exemplars, and also they have posted the the requirements, the knowledge requirements, the criteria for um, for each uh, grade. But it also depends on what kind of artwork are you practicing. What what are what are your students? Uh, learning at the moment? Is it uh, uh, modern art or is it classic art? Uh, remember Winnie the Pooh and, and try to communicate this and by communicating through examples that has been proven to be uh, a good way forward and perhaps it's not proven yet but it's it has potential compared to judgment could have the potential to at least get the flavor and and, uh, and invite students to what does success look like? Like this. Um, this is a description of something. Hmm. Compare this to criteria in the Swedish national syllabus. It doesn't say much, but maybe some of you can guess what this is about. Is it a, a a cake perhaps or is it a new flavor of chocolate or is it perhaps since it is saturday could it be a wine could be <laughs> wine <laughs> yes thomas <laughs> it's wine and i i'm not a wine connoisseur but and i can gladly admit that i i don't know if this is a good description of a wine but this is from um uh, the sustainable uh, the description of a wine. I'm, I'm not sure if it fits to my uh, dinner tonight or what, what kind of wine it is. But if I knew at least what bottle, and also if I got the experience of trying different wines, especially if I, if I can do that in, within a community of practice, uh, like connoisseurship, you can, be, you can be a wine connoisseur, but can you be also a STEM connoisseur, perhaps? Can we talk about this? We, as a professional, um, professional group of teachers, we need to talk about and try to put words on our expertise. We know a lot of things. We could easily, well, kind of easily, at least say this is a good piece of work, but it's much more difficult to express that in words. But if you have examples, and what if we could have like a wine tasting? Well, a STEM tasting. We could have a trial on student work and talk about this. We could, through digital tools, we can do this easily from different parts of the world. We can unite and have a, a cohort of student work, and then we can do comparative judgment, and then we can talk about this. As long as we file, find, follow the ethical guidelines, of course. Um, this is the same. 
this is what is the teacher did and uh, the the japanese um metal work teacher did when he was inviting his students to his area of expertise he contra contrasted two pieces of work and he pinpointed and, and he told the students so this is a good melt or this is a good melt maybe i'm not sure maybe you can fill in a rubric or you could put an um, absolute value of say 20 points or is it 30 points of and how many is top or 67 percent but what does it mean it's much better if you have an example and i see great potential of using comparative judgment for instance in teacher education at professional development but also during their their um, teaching training at the university to get an, a flavor of what quality work looked like. So, um, digital comparative judgment could be, could be a facilitator to improve teachers' assessment practices. I've just given you a very, very brief overview. I, I am aware of that. But I, 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 think, I think it has great potential. And it's not just me who thinks so. Uh, uh, Dr. Buckley and I have written an overview of comparative judgment where we go through different... We haven't covered all the papers, but quite a lot. And this is what we, um, we, see, we see great potential in this. And the Royal Society uh, also emphasize comparative judgment as a way, uh, a way forward in the future of assessment or practical STEM education. So there is potential here because you can, you can uh, facilitate the assessment, uh, I think primarily for the formative purposes in, in unpacking teachers' assessment practices in, in, in competences and broader, um, not just the correct answer or not. Here are uh, ingredients, like, like the wine connoisseur, for instance. And I also think because you do this collaboratively and you get a very high reliability, you get 90% and above, which is very, very high. And I think that's the um, power of the collective because you do this together and together we, we can do this and we also have very high reliability as a result. Uh, but it's not the whole truth and nothing but the truth. It's, it's an area, um, it's a catalyst for discussion. And it has what it seems that it has potential to support learning. And we need to dig deeper into that, I think. So to be continued, this was just a very <laughs> fast run through uh, some of the things, the, um, the potential for comparative judgment. It's much easier if you have a go. It's really, it's really simple. And I know teachers, um, especially uh, I know a technology teacher who, who do, does this on by hand with his, his uh, students where he have like free example of student work and they have, have this in front of them and they move them around and they talk about so this is why is this good from this particular perspective and such so. And this, this presentation would not have been possible without the support of the pupils in the schools and, uh, and the teachers in the schools and also to my, my lovely colleagues at Honinge and KTH and elsewhere. Um, because we have an international research community. So thank you and um, good luck and keep in touch. Um, cause I, I see that I have some questions in, in the chat and I ask, Bea, do I have any questions in the chat? No, I don't have any questions. <laughs> Clear as corpse ball, as we say. <laughs> yeah. If any one of you would like to have a, a trial on this, please contact me. And also, you can uh, just Google uh, comparative judgment. Oh, um, thank you, Shannon. Uh, could you please elaborate on some challenges the researchers faced during data gather gathering? Uh, well, uh, first of all, um, I did not talk much about that but when you do this you need you must have the, uh, the task that you want to do comparative judgment on you must assign that as a, um, as best as, as good as you can and also the students must be provided with with opportunities to show what they 
can. And they also need to be provided with opportunities to, to, uh, to learn. <laughs> you have to teach them stuff as well. But and gathering data. Um, I, as a researcher, I always um, seek informed consent. That's a bit of a um, struggle. Uh, not that they don't want to participate, but you need to sign the informed consent by the guardians and stuff. And then you need to have teachers who are willing to, to um, take the effort. But sometimes it, it's a bit of an extra effort to, to be involved in a research project. But we try to facilitate as much as we can and, and to adapt to the local context as much as we can. Previously, we have used um, iPads very easily to um, we use iPads in collecting data. Uh, the students did that, that themselves. Um, this one that uh, I showed, the, this ongoing study, that the students themselves have collected portfolios in, um, in Google Classroom, which is available in the schools that we are working with. Um, but then you need to upload them in the system, which can be a bit of a tri tricky. And you need someone to do that. So as a teacher, it, can, it might be too time consuming to actually do this because it's a bit of a hustle, hustle to, to do it. But that's why you need, you must make sure perhaps the software provider can help you with that. And you can upload different kinds of, of data. But you need to be very careful and depending on where you are, in which context you are, you need to make sure that, that this, um, the software that you use for comparative judgment is, is, um, is good enough for your context. For instance, I use RM Compare, and I have been very uh, we've been thorough, and they are thorough to making sure that they follow the GDPR, for instance. And then we also, oh, uh, and then we also, um, uh, what's the top at all? Oh, well, you had to be. You, you must be be sure. And I, yo, uh, I try to not include the students' faces. Uh, when we build the portfolio, when we designed the portfolios, for instance, they don't um, show their faces. They're not asked to show their faces. Actually, they are asked to not show their faces. We can have photos of their, their palms, for instance, or just a sketch that they have done. Um, previously, we, have, we worked with the video recordings, but then that, that it's a bit more tricky. So make sure that you have support from, from your software provider if, if you want to do this. And also ask the students and make, make sure that they know what they are going to do. Peer feedback, regardless if you do it face-to-face -face or through comparative judgment, they must know why are we doing this. And, and perhaps they can have a, a trial on, they could uh, provide feedback on mock examples, for instance. But perhaps from another year, or you as a teacher, you can do the task. Uh, in, dif in different qualities and then upload and then the students can have a go and see what which one is better and, and not you can do that do it as a teacher in our shopping he does it on, on pen and paper more or less on, on in, when the students have the papers in front of them or you could do it from comparative judgment if you do compare to judgment in a digital um, platform you and i can collaborate uh, for instance or a teacher in America, we can collaborate about this if we want to, or perhaps you can collaborate with a teacher next door. You can moderate um, and have a discussion about this. Yes, uh, Bodil, thank you for asking. I get too carried away when um, because I'm more in, in STEM education. Comparative judgment was introduced uh, in English writing. And that's where the, uh, by Alistair Pollitt uh, in, London, in Cambridge. He, and there's a lot, most of the research and most of the trials with comparative judgment has been made on written text and essays, which is very hard. Uh, um, assessing essays is hard. Assessing essays together with others and find a re high reliability is even harder. And and through comparative judgment, that there's multiple, there lots of, um, you can Google uh, no more marking, for instance, and then you find Daisy Christodoulou and her work with comparative judgment in English writing. Um, it, it's it's ama amazing uh, what they have done. And also there's a, 
group of teachers in outside of Oxford. And they, uh, the school principals in, in a school area, they've gone to, uh, get them, you know, gotten teachers together uh, for moderation. They've done that for years. They moderate their assessment across different schools uh, within that area. And then they found comparative judgment. So now they do this online and then they have also have more, they can um, have more exemplars in, in, a, in a cost efficient way because it, it does, it's not so time consuming uh, as traditional marking and then as area for discussion. Daisy Christodoulou. Don't ask me. Uh, Google Daisy and no more marking and then you will find her. And also Mareje. Uh, yes, Thomas. Uh, Daisy Christodoulou uh, is doing research on writing and also uh, Mareje Lesterhaus um, and Tine van Dahl in, in Belgium and the Netherlands. And um, yeah, that's the, the, uh, Alistair Pollitt, of course, uh, the guy who introduced it, 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 it here. And uh, so there's a, there's more more research in uh, writing, and not, it has been done in primary writing and in, in um, university um, thesis writing. It has been compared to judgment has been used also for perfume making. This smells better than that one for instance, and also it has been made um, used for applications to assess applications and grant calls. How do you do that? Well, they have tried. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, my dear friend uh, Bea has just um, uh, made me aware that we are out of time. I think we could continue uh, this conversation. So please stay in touch and also stay online for research at Hanninge today. Thank you. There is, oh, there is another um, presentation on comparative judgment with Scott Bartholomew later today. Watch that, watch that as well. Thank you everyone um, and take care.